Good morning. Merry Christmas. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Our call to worship comes from the letter to the Colossians, chapter 1, starting in verse 15. He, referring to Jesus, says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Let's go to the Lord, or Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you for sending your son Jesus to live for us, to die for us, to rise from the dead for us that we might find our joy and our pleasure in Him and bring glory to You. Lord, as we worship this morning, help us, Lord God. Revive our hearts for those who are weary, Lord, and for those who are thankful, Lord. Let, let these moments roll up in joy in knowing Your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us now to worship Him in song and in word and in deed. And we praise You. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you please stand for first hymn, hymn 132, angels we have heard on by hymn 132 in the great hymnals.
Merry Christmas. Happy also uh, Okay. Hey, so good morning. I just want to highlight a couple of quick announcements that are found on today, uh, the back of today's bulletin. Uh, first off, I, I don't know how many of you guys were affected by this this morning. There's like this once a year around the 25th of December, all natural alarm clock that happens between 0430 and 06. So I don't know if you guys have experienced that, you know, the, the pitter patter of the feet, the slamming open of the door, and then the jumping on your bed. So I don't know if you guys had that experience this morning in the past, but it's always a, a glorious way to wake up. All right, that's right. Now bring you back to the bulletin. So again, just want to highlight a couple of quick events. So again, we have a beautiful chapel, and on the 7th of January in a couple of weeks, we're going to be ungreening the chapel. So uh, please consider helping us to do that. Uh, also on the 8th January, Sunday school is going to resume, as well as children's church. And so that also means that it is, although it is praying the bulletin, we are not having children's church uh, today. Then also, uh, uh, ask that you prayerfully consider uh, possibly joining uh, the children's church rotation. So again, that's a a very uh, neat ministry for the kids that are uh, within the community here. So again, uh, ask that you prayerfully consider that. Also, just want to highlight, we have one new adult Sunday school class will be starting, uh, the first and second Timothy and Titus, and that's also going to be being on uh, 8 January. And also, uh, during our offering, this morning's offering is going to go to the community account as this morning's service is a combined service, so just something to uh, prayerfully consider as well. Then also, uh, please stay in touch. You can see the, the number to text, so we need a little bit more information that you'd like to share with us. And also, please don't hesitate to fill out the connection card that's located in the bulletin as well. Uh, please share your joys, concerns, and if you're a visitor, thank you for joining us. And please fill it out so we can get in touch with you. And then also, uh, we'll be right back here starting at our normal times next week, which is the 1st of January. So what is a great way to start out 2023 than being in the house of the Lord with fellow believers? So, you know, love to see each and every one of you guys join us uh, next week. Uh, but unfortunately, I do have some bad news for you this morning. Uh, we will not have any coffee or donuts uh, to celebrate fellowship afterwards. I apologize, Chapel Buchanan, and we can, uh, we can talk about it later. Okay, but again, this will give you the opportunity to go back and spend time with your family and friends uh, for the rest of the day. So again, thank you guys for joining us on this beautiful Christmas morning. If you don't mind, go ahead and stay for the next hymn. This hymn 136, the first no row.
recite the Apostles' Creed this week, I invite you to do it in consideration of, of Christmas. You know, it's this time of year where we celebrate the birth of Jesus, the King, who, the baby born to die, the baby born to be our King. The Apostles' Creed encapsulates the God that we worship, who he is, what he has done for us, and who we are because of who he is and what he has done. So if this is something that you recite often, it becomes somewhat normal, even perhaps mundane. Let the message of Christmas, the truth of who Jesus is and who the God is and who God is and what he has done for us, ring through every line. So Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and Dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Join me in prayer. Once again, Lord, we thank you for this day that we celebrate the birth of our Savior, of our Lord, of our King.
preserve our affections for you. This is the chapter of grace that now he prepares our way. Listens to you. Would you speak our hearts right now? And that your word would produce a harvest of lament in our life. We pray for Jesus. Thank you for being our Savior, our Lord, and our friend. It's in your name we pray.
school. God, I do ask that you would help us, that those here responsible would steward these gifts well, that our congregation would use them to be a blessing to one another and to the communities that we are in. Lord, that you may be honored and glorified in the work that you have to do through us. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Please be seated. Heaven 
what came here. As was said even last night, he didn't come to this world to make good people better. He came to this world to save the lost, to redeem sinners. But it's that picture, that perfect picture of this baby Jesus that sometimes can be a little bit misleading and it can actually distract us. And we'll get to that here in this message titled From Little Baby to Conquering King. And we look at this passage and you say, you know, Javelin, I'm not sure what we're doing in the book of Philippians. This is Christmas Day. This this should be a Christmas message. We should be looking at Matthew or Luke, Luke chapter 2. We, we could focus in on the manger. We could focus in on the, the wise men. We could focus in on perhaps the shepherds or the angels and the glory of God shining all around them and go, wow, this is what I'm looking forward to. But I'm here to say this morning that the totality of Scripture captures for us something different than an isolated event as magnificent and as miraculous as it was, as transformational as it was, this passage, Paul gives to us in one piece the totality of what is taking place and why it matters to us. Scholars believe that this passage may have actually been a hymn, sung, or, or a poem that it was known across the church at his time and merely capturing it in his writing to the Philippians. This passage that we're looking at, especially verses 6 through 11, captures the totality of Christ departing, descending, plunging out of heaven into this world. His work, his accomplishment in this world, and his triumphal, victorious resurrection. And now being seated on a throne, high and exalted, he is now ruler of all. And Paul captures this for us. And the meaning and the intent and purpose. And so we are not left with merely a baby Jesus who our world, our world happens to have. Our world is pleased that we can have this time of gift giving. This time of celebrating and focusing in on gifts. Something I didn't learn as a child very well. It really wasn't until actually I was married. I would say things to my wife like, oh, can't wait to celebrate Christmas and all of it. She's like, no, no, no. It's not about the presents. Oh, you're right. Plunges downward. It's actually mind bending to think that the king of the universe, the one who created it all, descended from heaven's height to the depth of messy, miserable life on this earth. Just think about that for a moment and reflect on that. Let it sink in. Jesus left his heavenly dwelling to come. Probably didn't have to face negative seven degrees below zero. And this morning, I don't know if in Israel he experienced this kind of cold. But the sun moved from eternity into history. Consider the vast, actually infinite distance in dignity that separates the Son who is equal to God the Father and who radiates His glory on the one hand. All of His majesty, all of His glory, all of His absolute perfection, high and exalted. And then compare that to the most exalted and 
admirable members of the human race. However we may want to measure that, maybe it's character, intelligence, or perhaps courage, strength, or influence, some other quality, take, take into consideration his magnificence and compare that to the very best that our human family has to offer. And the comparison falls so incredibly short for the divine Son of Jesus. When we reflect upon the magnificence of Christ, it puts our sense of our own importance into proper perspective. It brings it all down to size, and it narrows the gap. It narrows the gap between your self-image and your appreciation for those whom you have viewed as less significant than yourself. Thus, when you are in your workplace, when I'm in my workplace, or my church, or my neighborhood, my family, and you and yours, perhaps we will not be quite so tempted to throw around our rank or our position or our weight to cause us to ponder and pause the mind of Christ, as Paul says here. The Christ who left his dwelling in heaven and came to this world, not in self seeking, grasping, but with selfless sacrifice and giving. And now, lest we, we miss this, we fail to see it, we, we don't understand, our, our culture would like us to believe, and unfortunately there are those who will read their Bibles in such a way as they, they will wish to think and to tell us that it's because we're so great. That Jesus came to save us because we're so great. We are so great to be saved. And that we have somehow earned something. What do you suppose the real reason is? Why would he leave? Why would he plunge downward from his heavenly dwelling? And it's him that's doing this. Verses 6, 7, and 8. It is Christ, Jesus, who is the subject. He is the one doing. He is the one who did not consider equality with God. He is the one who made himself nothing. He is the one taking on the very nature of a servant. He is the one who was made in human likeness. It was him found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself, says verse 8, and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus is the one who does this. It's not forced upon him. It's not required of him. It is not made of him. He does this. And he does this willingly for one reason. The scripture teaches us that Jesus does this, says John 8, 29, to please the Father. That is the most beautiful. He does it not to earn anything, but merely to please the Father. He is, he gives to us our model. Many people misunderstand Christianity. We think, they think that Christianity is a works righteousness religion, that you have to somehow do something to earn God's love and salvation, that you have to go out and prove that you're a good person, and that being a good person, he's going to make you better. And that is nothing further from scriptural truth than that. Jesus comes here to do what he did so that he would please the Father. He who 
sent me is with me. He has not left me alone because I always do the things that are pleasing to him, said Jesus. And in the same manner, this Christmas, if you haven't yet come to that place where you have repented and believed and put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus, it is not by works. You don't earn his love. You don't earn his salvation. You don't do something. I don't do anything. I can preach a thousand sermons. I can, I can lead congregations of 30, 50, 100,000, a million people and lead a million people to Christ. It doesn't do anything for my salvation. It is only because of Christ's work. And we then, after we place our faith in Him, we repent of our sin, we say, Jesus, please take my sin away from me, forgive me, make me whole. That we are declared, not made, declared righteous. And then, by virtue of our being born again, do we respond to the good news out of gratitude to please God? Our daily, our daily obedience, brothers and sisters in Lord Jesus Christ, our obedience daily is merely pleasing to Him. It is, it glorifies His name. It does nothing for our our standing, our salvation. Jesus' downward plunge is reversed. It is reversed by the Father who pulls him upward. Verse 9. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Paul uses a verb here in verse 9 that is found nowhere else in the New Testament. It is only found in the Greek Septuagint in Psalm 97 verse 9 where there in Psalm 97, 9, it says, You are exalted far above all gods. This idea of being exalted above, it is so beyond, it's so other. Paul uses this to demonstrate, to show that Christ Jesus is above all. There are no competitors, there's no possibility. It was through his resurrection and ascension that God made Jesus both Lord and Christ. And after his resurrection, Jesus declares his universal authority in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, verse 18. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, says Jesus. But this is nothing new. It was prophesied. It was prophesied by the prophet Daniel hundreds, hundreds of years earlier, more than 500 years earlier. And it's actually captured in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were themselves buried in a cave. Buried might be a stronger word. They were placed in a cave high and beyond anyone's knowledge until just less than a century ago, and they were placed there a century before Christ even entered this world. Daniel says in chapter 7, 13 and 14, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him. Speaking of Christ. As the victorious redeemer of God's guilty but beloved people, Jesus emerged from the grave on that third day. He entered heaven 40 days later and soon thereafter celebrated his enthronement by pouring out his Holy Spirit in power on his people. Christ reigns supreme. But these are these these verses here have a direct implication of a dream. 
Verses 6, 7, and 8 demonstrate what Christ did. Verse 9 shows what the Father did for the Son. And then verses 10 and 11. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here, there is an allusion to, and then elsewhere, Paul speaks of the triumphant entry, the triumphant entry, the triumphant procession of Christ, as he spoke, speaks in 2 Corinthians 2.14, but thanks be to God, who is Christ, who in Christ always leads us in triumphant procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. Paul is using this imagery from his day and his time, but on a galactic scale. You see, because he, being a member of, the, of Rome, as he was a Roman citizen, but also during the time of the Roman Empire, Romans had a, a civil as well as a religious ceremony, an ancient rite, that when they conquered their enemies, they would take a portion of their enemies, bind them, and then proceed to lead them through the streets of Rome. At the head of this procession was the commander, the general. The general wore a special toga, all purple with gold embroidery. And on his head, he wore a crown of laurel. Unprotected, he was in his chariot alone with four horses abreast. The commander, this general, would then lead this procession, this train of captives behind him, showing the Romans, the Roman Senate and the emperor latter years. What he accomplished and then continued to march them all the way to the temple of Jupiter. Sometimes the general would even paint his face in red. Then getting to the temple there at Jupiter would offer a portion of those captives as a sacrifice to the God of Jupiter. And Paul, seizing on this imagery, which all of his readers understood, they knew this, they understood this. And then Paul, not putting himself as the subject of Christ, he is merely the object, he is in the train of captives. You and I, by faith in Christ, are in his train. Christ leads this procession. He is the one who is the victor. He is the conqueror. He is the conquering king. And we are his prize. Because why? Because we willingly, now, today, willingly bow our knee. And we are a fragrance, not, not that we are put to death, no, but our lives become a fragrant offering. Paul talks about this elsewhere, a fragrance that the world may know who the conquering king is. And your obedience, my obedience, is glorifying to him. And that, that, brothers and sisters, is the imagery. That not only captures Paul and shares with his Philippian believers, but for us, as we meditate and think about, reflect on the beauty and the wonder of the Christ child coming into this world. It's not that he came into this world as a child and then later on disappears, but that he comes back. But he comes, he comes 
as the conquering king, and there is a day when he returns. And that, brothers and sisters, we get a glimpse into. We get a glimpse into that in Revelation chapter 19, verse 13, where we get this picture. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress in the fury and the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe, on his thigh, he has this written, this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That day is coming. We are here today, Christmas, celebrating his birth. We are worshiping. We are here to worship. We had choices to make this morning. We chose to be here. Christians world over choose to set aside their own personal priorities, their own personal desires own time to demonstrate not that the Christ child came but that the Christ child rose from the dead that he grew he lived among us he had a ministry of three faithful years he resisted temptation he resisted sin and evil he healed the sick caused the lame to walk he allowed himself to be placed on a cross the most humiliating death so humiliating, Romans wouldn't even speak about crucifixion. He was crucified, died, was buried three days. He rose from the dead victorious. And that, my friends, is why we worship on the Sabbath day, the Sunday, the first day of the week, and not on the Jewish Sabbath. As a testimony, a testimony that his resurrection is real. It has been for 2,000 years. We worship him every day in the Acts thoughts and the, and the things that we do. Our whole life is an act of worship. But we set aside time on Sundays to come together with brothers and sisters in fellowship and worship as a testimony of his great work, his great accomplishment. Revelation 5 then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. We worship a risen Savior and King who is triumphant and has and will. He will come again. Christmas is a wonderful, wonderful time of year. It is filled with laughter and fun and celebration, excitement and joy, memories. It is meant to be all of these great and wonderful things. It really is. And our hearts are meant to be full. But for one reason and one reason alone, dear brother. 
your sisters in Christ. Because Jesus came into this world as a gift of God. And on a mission to redeem us from our enslavement to sin. And all the consequences that come from that sin. Meaning, condemnation. It's magnificent. Let us be sure that this Christmas is a real and full Christmas. Let us worship him from our very hearts that have been redeemed by him. And if we have not yet, if there's anyone here who has not yet relinquished, surrendered control of their life, this is the day to willingly do so. Willingly bend your knee to Christ, our comforter. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise for this day that we can come together so freely as brothers and sisters in you, Lord Jesus, not fearing for, for persecution, not fearing for our lives, but to be able to do so freely and openly. Lord, enable us this day to go home with our families to celebrate the meals that we shall eat together and fill our hearts, Lord Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, reminding us constantly of who we are in you as you triumphantly proceed and as we benefit so greatly and so immeasurably from your great love. We pray this in Christ's name. I heard the bells on the Christmas day.
blood of eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.